morning. My name is Regina, and I will be your conference operator today. At this time, I would like to welcome everyone to the Comerica fourth quarter 2019 earnings conference call. All lines have been placed on mute to prevent any background noise. After the speaker's remarks, there will be a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question during that time, simply press star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. If you would like to withdraw your question, press the pound key. I would now like to turn the call over to Darlene Persons, Director of Investor Relations. Ma'am, you may begin. Thanks, Regina. Good morning, and welcome to Comerica's fourth quarter 2019 earnings conference call. Participating on this call will be our President and CEO, Kurt Farmer, Interim Chief Financial Officer, Jim Herzog, Chief Credit Officer, Pete Kilfoyle, Executive Director of the Business Bank, Peter Sesnick. During this presentation, we will be referring to slides which provide additional details. The presentation slides and our press release are available on the SEC's website, as well as in the Investor Relations section of our website, Comerica.com. This conference call contains forward-looking statements, and in that regard, you should be mindful of the risks and uncertainties that can cause actual results to materially vary from expectations. Forward-looking statements speak only as of the date of this presentation, and we undertake no obligation to update any forward-looking statements. Please refer to the Safe Harbor Statement in today's release and slide two, which I incorporate into this call, as well as our SEC filings for factors that can cause actual results to differ. Also, this conference call may reference non-GAAP measures. In that regard, I direct you to the reconciliation of these measures within the presentation. Now I'll turn the call over to Kurt, who will begin on slide three. Good morning, everyone. Today we reported full year 2019 earnings per share of seven dollars and eighty-seven cents, a nine percent increase over 2018. Highlights for the year included driving strong loan growth, which pushed total assets to a record level, while continuing to serve our relationship-oriented deposit base. Also, with the benefit of higher fee income, revenue reached an all-time high. This growth, along with careful expense control, resulted in an efficiency ratio of under 52%. In addition, credit quality remained solid, and we meaningfully reduced excess capital. Our book value grew 10%, for we raised our dividend 46%. Also, our ROE increased to above 16%. Slide 4 provides details on our 2019 results. Average loans increased 4%, including strong growth in the first two quarters of the year. Deposit trends picked up significantly in the second half of the year, resulting in relatively stable balances year over year. As far as net interest income, the benefit from loan growth and the net impact from higher rates was offset by an increase in interest-bearing deposits as well as wholesale funding. The provision increased from a very low level in 2018 and reflected continued solid credit quality with 21 basis points of net charge-offs or only four basis points excluding energy. We repurchased 18.6 million shares during the year reducing our average share account by 11%, and together with an increase in our dividend, returned $1.8 billion to shareholders. In summary, we achieved record earnings per share and continue to enhance shareholder value. Turning to slide five, fourth quarter earnings were $269 million, or $1.85 per share. These results demonstrate our ability to drive solid returns with an ROE of nearly 15% and an ROA of 1.5% despite declines in interest rates. Broad-based deposits and non-interest income growth, strong credit quality, and continued active capital management were positive contributors to our performance. Compared to the third quarter, average loans remained relatively steady, as expected. Mortgage banks are continued to benefit from robust refi activity. Also, commercial real estate and environmental services maintain their growth trends. This was offset by declines in general middle market as well as national dealer, which was partly due to lower inventory levels. The tone of recent conversations I've had with customers and colleagues across our markets is optimistic, and we continue to see slow and steady economic expansion. We are focused on employing new customer acquisition, cross-sell, and retention strategies that we have launched over the past year, and we continue to make the customer experience a corporate priority 
as we seek to raise the expectations of what a bank can be. While loans were relatively slow, deposit growth was robust, increasing $1.5 billion relative to the third quarter, with almost every business line contributing. The mix of the growth was favorable, with over 40% coming from non-interest-bearing deposits. In conjunction with this growth, we have reduced higher cost broker deposits by nearly $700 million. Our interest bearing deposit costs declined seven basis points to 92 basis points in the fourth quarter. We are closely monitoring the competition, and with recent Fed rate cuts, we have taken action to adjust deposit pricing. By carefully managing our deposit rates, we are attracting and retaining relationships. Our strategy is working and it's clearly demonstrated by our deposit growth. The increase in relationship deposits allowed us to reduce higher cost wholesale funding and help reduce our low total funding cost to 71 basis points. Also, our loan to deposit ratio decreased to 88%. Of note, the U.S. Treasury recently announced that we will continue to be the exclusive financial intermediary for the Direct Express Government Benefits Card Program for another five years. The economics of this program include attractive retail deposits that should continue to grow and our ability to leverage a third-party platform for processing and servicing. As far as net interest income, over 80% of our loans are floating rate and primarily tied to 30-day LIBOR, which on average declined 39 basis points during the quarter. Lower rates were the primary driver for our net interest income decline to $544 million, resulting in a net interest margin of 3.2%. We added $750 million of swap in October and an additional $1 billion in early January. Our strategy is to continue to build our hedging program over time, closely monitoring the markets and then taking advantage of opportunities as they arise. Credit quality remained strong in the fourth quarter, with net charge-offs of only 16 basis points. Charge-offs continue to primarily consist of valuation impairments on select energy credits, as capital markets for this sector remain soft. Excluding energy, net charge-offs were only $2 million. Non-performing assets declined and were only 43 basis points of total loans, and the provision decreased to $8 million. A $10 million increase in non-interest income helped offset the more challenging rate environment. We had strong growth in customer derivative income as well as a gain from the sale of our healthcare savings or HSA business, along with incremental growth in several other categories. Expenses increase is expected primarily related to higher compensation, outside processing, and seasonal occupancy. This is in line with the outlook we provided for full-year expenses to remain flat, excluding 2018 restructuring costs. We maintain our targeted 10% CET1 target. We return $246 million in capital to shareholders through our dividends, which currently provides almost a 4% return, and by repurchasing 2.1 million shares under our share buyback program. And now we'll turn the call over to Jim. Thanks, Kurt, and good morning, everyone. Turning to slide six, as Kurt indicated, average loans were stable in the fourth quarter with increases in commercial real estate, mortgage banker, and environmental services, offset by decreases in general middle market and national dealer. Relative to the fourth quarter last year, average loans were up $1.7 billion. Total commitments as a quarter end were stable compared to the third quarter, with growth in commercial real estate, equity fund services, U.S. banking, and general middle market, offset by reductions in energy, dealer, and technology and life sciences. Our pipeline remains solid. Our loan yields were 4.43%, a decrease of 40 basis points from the third quarter. This was a result of lower interest rates, primarily one-month LIBOR, in addition to a $3 million decline in non-accrual interest from an elevated third quarter level. Slide 7 provides details on deposits. Average balances increased $1.5 billion, with growth across all three of our markets. Non-interest bearing deposits increased over $600 million, 
while customer interest-bearing balances increased $1.45 billion. We managed our higher-cost broker deposits down about $700 million. As far as deposit costs, with a decline in interest rates, we adjusted deposit pay rates throughout the quarter. Together with a decline in broker deposits, we achieved a seven basis point decrease in our interest-bearing deposit costs. This is at the high end of the guidance we have previously provided. As you can see in slide eight, our MBS portfolio is stable and the yield on the portfolio held steady. Yields on recent purchases have been around 2.4%. We have had a modest increase in prepays in the back half of the year, but this has not had a significant impact on our duration or the unamortized premium, which remains relatively small. Turning to slide nine, Net interest income was $544 million, and the net interest margin was 3.2%. Loans had a negative impact of $55 million, or 31 basis points to the margin. The major factor was lower interest rates, which had a $46 million impact and 28 basis points on the margin. Also contributing to the decrease were lower balances, a decline in non-accrual interest from elevated levels, and to a lesser extent, other portfolio dynamics including lower loan fees. Fed deposits added $3 million, but had a seven basis point negative impact to the margin. Higher balances added $7 million, but resulted in a five basis point drag on the margin. The lower Fed rate had an impact of $4 billion, or two basis points. Lower rates improved deposit costs by $3 million, or two basis points on the margin, and reduced wholesale funding costs by $7 million, adding four basis points to the margin. In summary, given the nature of our portfolio, our loans were priced very quickly. Therefore, the net impact of lower rates, including the full quarter impact of the July and September rate cuts, along with October's, was the primary driver of our net interest income in the fourth quarter. Assuming rates remain steady going forward, we believe the bulk of impact from lower rates is behind us. Credit quality was strong, as shown in slide 10. Our net charge-offs were $21 million, or 16 basis points. Excluding energy, net charge-offs were only $2 million. Total non-performing assets declined to 43 basis points, one of the lowest levels since 2006, and criticized loans comprised only 4% of total loans as of quarter end. As far as energy, while charge-offs were lower in the fourth quarter than the previous two quarters, we continue to see impairment of select energy loans with valuations of a few liquidating energy assets impacted by volatile oil and gas prices, as well as weak capital markets. Energy non-accrual loans decreased $31 million. However, we have seen a moderate amount of negative migration as criticized energy loans increased $146 million. Therefore, we increased our reserve for energy, which remains at a very healthy level. Our reserve ratio for total loans held steady at 1.27% and resulted in a provision of $8 million, a decline of $27 million from the third quarter. As far as our adoption of CISO as of January 1, our implementation process has been successful and is virtually complete. Given the relatively short duration of our commercially weighted portfolio, and the expectation of a fairly benign economic environment, we expect the change in reserve will be a decrease of 0 to 5%, and therefore will have little impact on our capital ratios. Non-interest income increased $10 million, as shown on slide 11. Customer derivative income increased $7 million, including the rate impact on the credit valuation adjustment. Commercial lending fees increased $2 million with robust syndication activity. We also had small increases in several other categories, including investment banking, brokerage fees, and securities trading. This was partly offset by a $5 million decrease in card fees as a result of a mix shift in the transaction volumes of government cards, as well as two fewer business days in the quarter, impacting corporate and merchant card volumes. Also, fiduciary income decreased $1 million, mainly due to tax preparation fees received in the third quarter. During the quarter, we sold our HSA business for a gain of $6 million. Of note, deferred combat debt returns, which were offset in non-interest expenses for $3 million, the same level as the third quarter. 
Turn to expenses on slide 12. Salaries and benefits increased $4 million. This was a result of higher incentive compensation and commissions tied to performance, as well as seasonal health care expense. In addition, outside processing increased $4 million due to a vendor transition fee, and seasonality drove a $2 million increase in occupancy expenses, as well as several other categories. We continue to carefully manage costs as we invest for the future, as evidenced by our efficiency ratio of 55%, which is well below the third quarter peer average. In the fourth quarter, we repurchased $150 million, or 2.1 million shares, under our share repurchase program, as shown on slide 13. Together with dividends, we returned $246 million to shareholders. Our goal is to continue to return excess capital back to shareholders and maintain our CDT1 ratio at approximately 10%. Turning to the rate environment on slide 14. Assuming interest rates remain at the current levels, the net impact from rates is estimated to be $10 to $15 million on our first quarter net interest income relative to the fourth quarter. This includes the full quarter effect of the recent Fed cuts combined with the actions we've taken to lower deposit rates. Of course, actual results will vary depending on a variety of factors, such as slide board movements. As far as the remaining three quarters of 2020, if rates hold steady, we expect to see a relatively smaller residual effect from rates as longer dated assets and liabilities reprice. In addition, continued hedging activity could have a modest negative impact. We continue to work to gradually moderate our asset sensitivity. We added $750 million to our hedging portfolio in October and $1 billion in early January. We currently have about $5.5 billion in interest rate swaps, with an average remaining tenor of about three years and are currently in the money. Overall, we remain positive and constructive on the U.S. economy, and we plan to make steady progress in building our hedging portfolio over time. Slide 15 provides our outlook for 2020, which assumes a continuation of the current rate and economic environment. We expect average loans to grow approximately 2 to 3% in 2020 relative to 2019. We anticipate continued slow, steady economic expansion, yielding growth in most business lines. This is expected to be partly offset by a decline in mortgage banker from elevated levels as refi volumes normalize, and a modest reduction in national dealer services, driven by a predicted reduction in auto sales. As far as the first quarter, we expect loan growth from most business lines will be mostly offset by a decline in mortgage banker due to seasonality, combined with the slowdown in refi activity. We expect average deposit growth of 1 to 2%. We believe we will have the normal seasonality through the year, including the typical first quarter decline. Our goal is to continue to attract and retain long-term customer relationships by offering superior products and services, along with the appropriate pricing. As I discussed in the previous slide, the rate impact on net interest income is expected to be mostly absorbed in the first quarter, with an additional modest effect for the remainder of the year. Also, the full-year expense of higher wholesale funding will have an impact. In addition, we expect a six to eight million dollar decrease in non-accrual interest recoveries from the elevated level we saw in 2019. Loan growth is expected to provide a partial offset. We believe our portfolio will continue to perform well, resulting in net charge-offs similar to 2019 in the 15 to 25 basis point range. Given the new CESOL accounting standards, which became effective January 1st, and assuming the current economic backdrop, we expect provision should be slightly above net charge-offs after taking into consideration our loan growth outlook. <clears throat> Note that this new standard may cause greater volatility in our provision. As far as sound interest income, we expect growth of about 1% led by cars and fiduciary fees. Our expectation includes declines in certain key categories that had strong growth in 2019, such as customer derivative and warrant income. Also, deferred comp, which totaled $9 million in 2019, is hard to predict and is not assumed to repeat. As far as the first quarter, Keep in mind that the fourth quarter included the gain on the sale of the HSA business. 
In addition, we have strong derivative income and syndication fees, as well as deferred comp of $3 million, all of which are dependent on market conditions and therefore may not continue at these levels. Expenses are expected to increase approximately 3% year over year. We expect to see a rise in outside processing tied to fee income growth and increasing technology investments as we execute on revenue and efficiency related projects that are in flight. In addition, we expect inflationary pressures on items such as annual merit, staff insurance, and marketing. As a result of lower discount rate, pension expenses increasing about $7 million. Also, recall the first quarter includes elevated salaries and benefits expense due to share, annual share compensation and associated higher payroll taxes, which are expected to be mostly offset by seasonally lower marketing and occupancy expenses. Our effective tax rate is expected to be approximately 23%, and as far as capital, we expect to maintain our CEP1 target of approximately 10%. Now, I'll turn the call back to Kurt. Thank you, Jim. The outlook we have provided reflects our expectations for continued moderate U.S. expansion through 2020. A cooler global economy and the strong value of the dollar remain headwinds for U.S. trade. However, many sources of uncertainty that accumulated through 2019, such as China, Mexico, and Canadian trade agreements, have been or may soon be resolved. The interest rate environment looks stable for the year ahead and the labor market in the U.S. remains strong and will continue to support the consumer sector. We believe this backdrop should benefit us and our customers as the year progresses. Over our 170-year history, we have managed through many economic and interest rate cycles. With our efficiency ratio in the mid-50s and an ROE of nearly 15%, we are better positioned to weather changes in the economy or interest rate environment. We remain focused on controlling the things we can control to maintain our solid performance. Our 2019 results demonstrate our ability to grow revenue while maintaining favorable credit metrics and well-controlled expenses. Our key strengths provide the foundation to continue to enhance long-term shareholder value, specifically our geographic footprint, which includes faster-growing, diverse markets, combined with our relationship banking strategy is expected to result in growth of loans, deposits, and fee income. We continue to maintain our proven expense discipline as we invest for the future. Also, our conservative, consistent approach to banking, including credit and capital management, has positioned us well. Now we'd be happy to take your questions. At this time, if you would like to ask a question, press star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. We'll pause for just a moment to compile the Q&A roster. Our first question will come from the line of Ken Zerby with Morgan Stanley. Great. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I guess why don't we start off in terms of the NII outlook. I just want to make sure I really understand what you're trying to say here. Um, the way I read it is that first quarter is obviously down 10 to $15 million, and then the rate impact is going to be negative on NII, so dollars go lower in each subsequent quarter throughout 2020. But then you have, presumably, you have the asset growth offset to that. Are you trying to say that NII from a dollar basis is going to be lower than first quarter throughout the year? Or, like, how do you, how do you see the net impact of all the different factors affecting NII after first quarter? Thanks. Okay, Ken. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, we will see progressively lower impact from rates as we go through the year. You know, I mentioned the 10 to $15 million uh, in the first quarter. Um, it'll be a much smaller amount in the second quarter. Um, as of now, it might be, you know, call it, you know, the 5 to $7 million range. Then it becomes closer to a negligible number in the third and fourth quarter, even though we will see some impact um, all the way through the year. And, of course, I've mentioned uh, to the extent we have hedges, and depending on the rates there, that will obviously have an impact also. Um, we'll obviously pick up the volume as the year goes on, and you heard me mention the non-accrual impact that uh, overall will be an impact on 2020 compared to 2019. Sorry, be, I guess in, because you, I'm sure you guys do very detailed modeling for the year, 
is it right to assume that your NII, if you look at, say, fourth quarter of 20, is that going to be lower or higher than first quarter of 20? You should see volume overtake rate once we get beyond the first quarter to answer your question. Uh, so most of that rate impact is felt in the first quarter, and then uh, you are right, volume does start to step up and the rate impact starts to decline. So you start to see a crossover, you know, once you get into the second and third quarters. Gosh, okay. All right, that, that's helpful. Um, I guess maybe just in, well, like a second question. In terms of fee income, you mentioned, in, in I guess, in your guidance that, that assumes kind of um, things essentially no uh, – Oh, what is the right word? No returns on deferred compensation assets, and that's that's part of the assumptions driving your 1%. Can you just explain that, and is it possible that your fee growth is, is more than 1% if you do get returns on those assets? Well, obviously, uh, deferred comp is a bit of a wild card. It depends on the, uh, the market and the market returns on deferred comp. So it can actually be positive or negative. So I'd be very hesitant to assume there's going to be any kind of um, return there. Um, in fact, it could go the other direction. Got it. Understood. Okay. And then just one, if I can sneak one last one in, in terms of your loan growth, I'll say the 2 to 3%. I think last quarter you talked about something around nominal GDP, and I, I guess my interpretation of nominal GDP was closer to 4%. Can you just comment, are you seeing weakness or any kind of deterioration? I mean, presumably you are seeing some weakness in your expectation for loan growth this quarter versus last quarter, and, and what's driving that? Thanks. Hey, Ken, this is uh, Peter. I, I think the 2 to 3% that we've communicated, we, we feel, feel good about. We have seen a little bit of a slowdown in the fourth quarter, and I think we listed the businesses that, you know, where we've seen that. There have been some sort of interesting timing on what we've had in dealer and mortgage. But going into 2020, um, we feel good about our ability to, to accomplish the, the 2 to 3% that we've communicated. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of John Penn Carey with Evercore ISI. Good John. Good morning. Good morning. Um, uh, and then also on the NII topic, um, so I guess this outlook implies probably that we got some incremental compression in the net interest margin in the fourth quarter. Um, and then can you talk about how the margin should progress beyond that? Is it fair to assume – stable or, or some incremental compression from there as we move through uh, second, third, and fourth quarter of 2020? Thanks. Okay. Yeah, happy to answer that. Um, you have a couple of factors that will be netting against each other. You know, we did know um, that we have about five bits of compression uh, due to the higher balances. That's the excess liquidity that you saw in the fourth quarter. But you're going to have to net against that the $10 to $15 million guidance that I offered in the first quarter and progressively smaller amounts after that. And so, you know, if you do the simple math on that, it would imply um, a modest reduction from the current 320. Having said that, we're always hesitant to provide minimum percentage guidance just because it is so impacted by excess liquidity, which based on our customer profile is very hard to predict. Okay, got it. Uh, and then on the expense front, um, you indicate in your guidance that you um, your expense outlook is impacted in part by higher outside processing expenses um, related to revenue. And you mentioned in your comments, too, it seems like maybe fee revenue. Can you talk about what that is? And then separately, can you talk about what expense levers you may have incrementally as you look at 2020, given the tougher revenue backdrop and any consideration for pulling back even harder on the expense side? Thanks. Okay. Can you start? Yeah, very uh, specific to the uh, the outside processing fees. So we actually do have some good core growth in a number of line items um, in 2020. You know, one of those is card income, and of course we have associated outside processing fees with that. Um, now, you know, some of these uh, strong core line item growth areas that we have will be offset by some of the items that I mentioned. You know, the very strong year we had in 2019 with syndications, warrants. You know, derivatives, and of course the deferred comp item that we talked about earlier. Um, but we do expect a strong card year, and we will have some uh, outside processing fees associated with that. And regarding your second question on, you know, where could we pull back? Um, you know, we are always very focused on expense control. Um, I think we have to keep in mind that we're starting again from a very strong position. 
with 55% efficiency ratio. But we do feel it's important to make the proper investments in technology and make sure that we're, you know, pushing forward in terms of moving the company to where it needs to be. So we are going to continue to invest in technology and don't anticipate pulling back on that at this point in time. Okay, got it. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Stephen Alexopoulos with J.P. Morgan. Hey, good morning, everybody. To follow up first on John's question on expenses, so if we look at the 3% expected increase in 2020, is there anything unusual you would call out? I mean, pension sounded like it was $7 million, or do you think that's a good run rate for the company here as you continue to reinvest? Yeah, pension would be the only uh, real unusual item there. You know, I would say uh, normal inflation, including merits, would be the largest item. Um, so, you know, nothing too unique in terms of what makes up that expense base. You know, going forward, I'd be hesitant to call that a run rate. What we're really focused on is really operating leverage going forward. Um, you know, we do have a bit of a transition year with some of the pension expense and some of the strong non interest income headwinds that we talked about earlier. But we're really more focused on positive operating leverage, and that's where we expect to get in the future. Okay. That's helpful. And I just was looking for more color. You guys put up really strong growth in deposits in the quarter. Give more color on why it was so strong. Yeah, it was a very strong uh, quarter. We were very pleased with it. Um, we, you know, we talked about being up 1.5 billion. But keep in mind, we ran off about 700 million of brokered uh, CDs. So the way I look at it is, you know, we actually are up about 2.2 billion or so in deposits. So we were very pleased there. Um, it's a very concerted effort to go out and deposit gather. Uh, we priced appropriately where we needed to. Um, you know, these are relationships that we pulled into the bank. Uh, none of these were uh, standalone deposits. Now, I will say that probably at least half of this is seasonal, and it's always hard to tell, um, you know, when this money might bleed out during the first quarter. Um, but, you know, approximately half, maybe a little half from what I can tell is seasonal. But there is a strong component of it that I think is core and will stick with us through the year, even if we see a minor uh, decline in the first quarter. So this is Kurt. I might I might add, uh, uh, Stephen, that the relationship uh, component that Jim talked about, we made a deliberate strategy not to try to chase uh, sort of hot money or transactional deposits, but have really leveraged our deposit pricing uh, and programs that we've had in place, like our CD program around new client acquisition and acquiring uh, additional deposits from existing customers, which I think is the right strategy for us longer term and very consistent with our relationship-based approach. Okay. That's helpful. Maybe just one final one. Kurt, your comments recently about Comerica potentially being an acquirer got quite a bit of attention. I'm curious, are you actively having conversations with Target, or is this something you're just thinking of really over the longer term? Thanks. Yes, yeah, Stephen, I, I think maybe uh first thing I would say is that if you if you read the text of anything that has been written on me, there is no uh, change in any of our strategy. There were a few headlines that uh, maybe were, I think, a little bit misleading. We are very focused on organic growth, as we have been uh, for a long time. We've done two acquisitions in the last uh, 20 years, and, and what we've said and what I've said and Ralph, before me, is that uh, if there's something that makes sense in Texas and California that would be a good uh, strategic fit and one of the major metropolitan areas and made the right economics for our company and for our shareholders, we take a look at it. But uh, that lens is fairly uh, fairly narrow, and so sort of day in and day out, we continue to focus on uh, organic growth. Okay. Terrific. Thanks for taking my questions. Your next question comes from the line of Jennifer Dimba with SunTrust. Good morning, Jennifer. Good morning, Kurt. Um, question on asset quality. Um, it looks like, um, you know, the increase in criticized loans was energy-driven. Um, just wondering if you guys think um, charge-offs will be higher in that sector this year or lower and are you seeing any other underlying weakness in any other sector um, in your portfolio? Thanks. Yes, yeah, Jennifer. So, you know, we're guiding uh, 75 to 125 basis points in charge-offs. And uh, to take a look at uh, 2019, uh, only four basis points 
of X energy charge offs. We don't think that's sustainable. So we would expect that uh, X energy, we, we would see slightly higher charge offs than what we saw in 2019, and we're hopeful that um, that could be offset um, fully or at least partially by lower energy charge offs. So that, that remains to be seen, but that's, that's where we get the outlook. Okay. Are you seeing any any weakness at all in any other sectors or geographies, Pete, at this point? No, we're really not. You know, four basis points of X energy charge offs in twenty nineteen, only two million in, in net charge offs X energy in the fourth quarter. Our non accrual levels are uh very low levels, um, and that includes energy. So we're seeing a lot of strength, particularly in the forty eight billion dollars of the portfolio that is, is Energy. Okay. One other question. Um, you, we saw a major transaction announced in Texas recently. Just wondering if you guys are expecting any merger disruption opportunities from that transaction. Thanks. Jennifer, there's always disruptions that occur in markets when uh, transactions occur, but I, I would say in general, I mean, you know, there's nothing that strategically changes our focus as an organization, and uh, we are in some different segments and some different customer focus than um, a number of those transactions that have occurred. Okay. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Mike Mayo with Wells Fargo Securities. Good morning, Mike. Mike, you may be on mute. Mike? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. I'm oh, sorry about that. Um, so how much was your technology spending last year? How much do you think it will increase? And what are the areas of technology spending focused? Yeah, we, Jim, you want to start on uh, that and then I'll add in around some of the areas of focus? Yeah, uh, Mike, we don't quote a specific number of technology spending simply because it's so difficult and challenging to get an apples and apples look with other banks and define exactly um, what falls in the technology bucket. But I will say we have a, uh, as implied in the uh, expense outlook for 2020, we do have a modest increase in expense. Uh, technology expense in 2020 over beyond the strong spend in 2019. So it is something that we continue uh, to invest in. And I might just add to that, uh, Mike, that um, we've talked before about the Gear Up initiative having positioned us well from an overall technology spend. And we did a lot of work the last several years to rationalize uh, many of our applications and some of our aging platforms. I think we've been a leader in terms of cloud migration, especially in non-customer interfacing applications. And then a lot of the work we have done um, around that uh, has helped free up capacity for us for new new projects. In the last 12 months, that has included a, a, a new across-the-company loan origination and servicing platform, a new company-wide CRM platform, major investments in data analytics, uh, to help us in the, the, the marketing and servicing of our clients, major upgrades to our call center uh, technology. And then for 2020, uh, a number of key areas of focus and, and items that will be coming online uh, related to upgrades to our ATMs, um, major upgrades to our banking center infrastructure and uh, technology, including enabling all of our employees in the banking center uh, with tablets to make them more uh, mobile and uh, they're selling and servicing efforts, uh, a pretty major uh, uh, upgrade to our onboarding capabilities on the digital side for our consumer uh, prospects and customers, and then uh, fairly uh, significant upgrades to our treasury management platform and the payments area, as well as a new portal um, uh, for our wealth management clients. So uh, we continue to be very focused on things that I would put in the category of colleague and customer enablement. Um, and like most institutions, we have a, a longer-term roadmap we're working on, but we feel like we are well-positioned relative to uh, our competitors and providing um, a, a really good experience uh, to our customers. And then one uh, follow-up. I assume you employ many vendors to help you with this transformation. Um, what took place with the vendor transition cost? I guess 
you always have a balance of getting vendors to help you facilitate the transition. On the other hand, there's always the risk of vendor lock-in. And during this quarter, you had a vendor transition cost. But can you describe the analysis that goes into selecting vendors, how you, you know, prepare against too much vendor lock-in versus the goal of transforming the company faster? I might take the sort of second part of your question, and then I'll turn to Jim for the more specifics around the, the expense in the quarter. Uh, we do have a, a number of key uh, vendor relationships, like most institutions, given uh, the size of the organization we are. We try to write, try the right balance between proprietary capabilities and leveraging uh, third parties where it makes sense. Um, those third parties go through the exact same oversight process that we do as if we were uh, building something or servicing something in-house, including robust uh, cyber uh, oversight. And we believe we've got really good uh, relationships that we can leverage, and, and we try to get uh, to a good point in terms of balance uh, and, and uh, trying to help uh, concentration issues with any one uh, single, single vendor. So, Jim, do you maybe want to talk about the specifics around the quarter? Yeah, I would say that, you know, other than size, there was actually nothing real unusual about this uh, vendor transition. We're always evaluating our vendors uh, to do the right thing for both ourselves and the customers. It's not unusual for us to have a uh, vendor transition. Uh, this one was a little bit larger, um, but it's something that we're always uh, evolving on in terms of looking at both quality and costs and capabilities. And um, I would just say that this is a one-time cost that, the larger than uh, typical, it's not unusual. We have I have vendor transitions um, really every year, and sometimes uh, m multiple times in a within a year. So, you know, that's I, I think there's probably not a lot more to, to do that other than the size. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mike. Your next question comes from the line of Ken Houston with Jeffries. Good morning, Ken. Hey. Hey, thanks. Good morning. Um, question on the deposit cost side of things. You mentioned that you saw the seven basis point decline in costs and just wondering what happens from here in a stable rates environment. How much do you continue to have of just natural resetting in deposit costs versus what else from here would have to be more negotiated with, you know, across the customer base as you've talked about in the past? Thanks. Okay. Yeah, yeah happy to answer that. Um, we did reprice deposits throughout the fourth quarter, as I've mentioned. So um, even though we saw the seven basis points decline in the fourth quarter, you know, I would expect a continued decline in the first quarter just based off the efforts undertaken thus far. Uh, the change in the first quarter will be uh, a smaller amount than the seven bits that we saw in the fourth quarter. I'd probably characterize it based on actions taken to date um, as being kind of the lower single digits of bits. Uh, but we'll see where things play out there. You know, the two things that, um, two or three things that could cause a further reduction, you know, one is we did see some mix shifts in the fourth quarter. Um, the actions that we actually took in the fourth quarter uh, probably would imply a little larger dip reduction, but we did see some of our relationship uh, deposits uh, grow related to some of the higher priced accounts. So whether or not some of that mix shift unwinds remains to be seen, uh, but that could be a tailwind. Then I would say it really depends on uh, the competition and what happens in the competitive landscape. You know, I've seen a little bit of fall of the leader out there in terms of deposit pricing. And I think that, in turn, for the industry will be driven by uh, loan growth and the demand for funding. Um, you know, that's certainly true specific to Comerica, but I think larger picture, it affects the entire industry, and we're not immune from that. So we'll continue to watch the competitive landscape and do the right thing for our customers and for our balance sheet. Got it. And one more question just on the mix of earning assets. With all this good deposit growth that you have, a lot of it ended up just sitting in cash. And unfortunately, 10 years still at 180 or so. So how do you start to think about if this deposit growth continues or hangs around? Does it just stay in cash or given the, you know, not much of an optionality versus securities book or, or do you start to flush it back into the securities book over time? Well, we do expect um, some of these deposits to leave in Q1. As we mentioned the seasonality factor, both in Q4 and the typical Q1 seasonality. Uh, so how much liquidity and excess liquidity we have remains to be seen. To the extent we do have excess liquidity, you know, I would say it really depends on, uh, you know, the interest rate landscape. 
in general, we are happy with the size of our securities portfolio, and the, the curve is flat enough that there's not a lot of percentage in tying up that liquidity at this point in time. Uh, that's something we would continue to monitor, but I would not anticipate growing our securities book in terms of size at this point in time. All right, great. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Jim. Your next question comes from the line of Erica Nigerian with Bank of America. Good morning, Good morning. Erica. Good morning. I just wanted to follow up um, to your response to um, Steve's earlier question on operating leverage. Obviously, in 20, given the, um, the poor comparison um, to 19 NII, that's obviously quite difficult. But is the message that as we look out into 2021, um, there's more flexibility uh, for the expense growth to be less than 3% or at least – um, you have more levers to pull it lower than um, revenue growth. So, Eric, this is Kurt. I, I would say that, you know, when you look at the history of our company, especially the last year, we definitely have had a proven expense discipline. You look at the performance metrics, uh, they really are the top of our, our peer group, and we expect them to be near the top of our peer group once everybody uh, reports, and especially the, the efficiency ratio. So we know how to manage expenses. We've done a good job of that in our history. We remain very focused on expense management. Uh, there are a few dynamics in play in 2020 that Jim, Jim talked about, and we are going to continue to strike the right balance between managing expenses and investing the things that we need to invest in longer term uh, to help our customers and to serve our customers appropriately and to grow the in institution. But you should expect for us longer term to remain uh, focused on positive operating leverage, and there's always additional levers that we can pull. We don't believe strategically that sometimes those are the right things to do. And again, striking the right balance between uh, investing in uh, technology and things of that nature uh, and uh, sort of the overall uh, expense uh, growth numbers. Got it. And, and my second question is, uh, you bought back almost $1.4 billion worth of stock, um, which really helped in a, in a year when um, the Fed cut three times. And with the CET1 ratio just 14 basis points above target, how should we think about buyback appetite in 2020? Yeah, yeah we um, – for us, it's a pretty simple um, target in terms of we're simply calibrating what we need to support our loan growth you know, support our dividend, and then calibrate that against earnings generation. And the goal is simply to come as close to 10% as we can. Uh, and we've been in that ballpark the last two quarters, and I would anticipate saying, you know, plus or minus to that 10% uh, throughout 2020. This is a follow-up question. I, I think I ask you this every quarter, but can you just remind us, um, what what is your actual capital binding constraint? Because I'm sure a lot of peer or a lot of investors look at the CET one, and you know it's 150 basis points above the targets of some much larger regional banks. Um, but if you could remind us what your actual binding constraint is on capital. Yeah, there's a, a couple of ways of looking at that. If you look at it from a pure stress testing standpoint, you know, the binding constraint would be uh, tier one. You know, we obviously don't have preferred in our stack. But there is another way of looking at it, and that is, you know, we're always conscious of our constituents, you know, rating agencies, regulators, customers. And from that standpoint, the CET1 is a very important ratio, too. So I'm not sure I would say there's just one binding constraint. It depends on, you know, what perspective you're looking at it from. Understood. Thank you. Take care, Erica. Your next question comes from the line of Michael Rose with Raymond James. Good morning, Michael. Hey, good morning. Hey, good morning. Um, just to, you know, just as we think about the the efficiency and the the technology expenses, there's been a lot of uh, talk on this call. Is there any change to you know kind of the intermediate term, you know, uh, profitability ROE ROA expectation, just given the front loading of some of the expenses and the uh, the, the revenue environment? Thanks. No, I you know we've uh, enunciated in the past that we expect to be in the low to mid you know ROEs. Um, you know, we could uh, drop to the, uh, you know, more of the low double-digit, I'm sorry, just to clarify, the low double-digit and mid-double-digit ROE, and we expect to stay in that range in the foreseeable future. Um, interest rates will be a significant impact uh, and driver there, so we'll see where those go. 
Uh, but we feel pretty good about the double-digit ROE uh, going forward at this point still. Okay. Uh, and then just one housekeeping question. Just when I look at the, the MPAs, how much of that is actually energy versus not energy when I look at the, the commercial bucket? Thanks. Um, it, yeah. Michael, I don't have a uh, breakdown for you, I don't think. It's on page. I do have a breakdown. Page 10. It's on page 10. So, All right. 3 million in energy, 156 million in uh, X energy. Okay. Sorry, I missed that. All right. Thanks for taking my questions. Thanks, Michael. Your next question comes from the line of Gary Tanner with DA Davidson. Hello, Hi, Gary. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I had a couple questions. One on the energy book. As you as you gave your guidance for loan growth in 2020, obviously you highlighted dealer services and mortgage. Um, I'm curious with the you know pretty significant decline this quarter in E&P uh, and what seems to be a, still a, kind of a challenging outlook for that segment. What what the appetite is for new new lending in that space in 2020? Peter? Yeah, Gary, this is Peter. So, I mean, our, our appetite is that we are still uh, looking for opportunities, but I would tell you that they're more limited in this environment that we're in. Um, you know, we're not seeing a whole lot of deal flow. You're seeing consolidation in the space, not a lot of capital coming into it. Um, but we're continuing to be a, a very important energy lender in the space. We've got really good relationships. We're going to support our customers, and to the extent there's new opportunities that make sense for us, um, you know, we're pursuing them. Okay, thanks. Uh, and then secondly, on the HSA business, I, I assume that there were some um, associated deposits with that line of business. If so, could you uh, just highlight what the amount was? You know, though, this is Jim. Those deposits were very negligible. They won't even lose the dial whatsoever. That's a fairly small scale business for us. Okay. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Peter Winter with Wedbush Securities. Uh, good morning. Good morning, Peter. Um, I was just wondering, I was looking at average loan growth. It seemed to have weakened a little bit uh, from the mid quarter. Uh, update, and I'm just wondering what drove that, and what gives you the confidence of the two to three percent uh, loan growth in, in 2020? Because first quarter is going to start off kind of flattish. Thanks, Peter. I'll let uh, be, yeah, I would, I would just you know remind you again for for last year we had you know four percent year over year loan growth. It felt really good. It was across kind of most of our businesses. In the first part of the year, we really saw good loan growth in middle market, and I think. As we got into the second half of the year, we saw a little bit um, really in, in California and Michigan where middle markets slowed down a little bit, but nothing that, you know, overly concerned us. Texas continued to perform really well. Um, so as we go into next year, we feel like our, our pipelines in, in middle market and those markets look really good, and we feel good about our specialty businesses. Um, again, we did see a little bit of dial back in dealer um, at the end of the quarter, um, our EFS business dialed back a little bit, but we still feel really good about those going into 2020 and, um, you know, feel like we're going to be able to achieve that 2 to 3% that we've communicated. Okay. And then on a separate note, just one housekeeping. The, the guidance for uh, net interest income um, in, the, in the first quarter uh, of down to 10 to $15 million, um, that, that does not include uh, one less day count. Which I think is about six to seven million. Is that right? That is correct. Yeah, we were simply guiding on the rate impact, and we mentioned the ten to fifteen million. So you're absolutely right. There will be the one day impact. Got it. Okay. Thanks very much. Thanks, Peter. Your next question comes from the line of Lana Chen with BMO Capital Markets. Good morning, Hi. Lana. Good morning. Uh, just a couple of cleanup kind of questions. One um, on the fee income side, the expectations for growth in 2020 um, from the fiduciary side, um, it was kind of flat in 2019. What's driving growth expectations in 2020? Yeah, fiduciary specifically? Yeah, I think that was uh, one of the uh, drivers of the fee income growth in 2020, card and fiduciary. Yeah, I would 
say a couple things related to uh, fiduciary. Uh, one, that's a business that, that we've been in for a, a long time and a business in which we have uh, scale, both in serving our existing clients, we're in the institutional trust business as well. And then we have a third-party trust platform where we provide trust services for many of the larger uh, broker dealers in, in, in the U.S. And so we see growth opportunities kind of across all of those uh, various buckets. Um, uh, fiduciary is also one of those categories that is impacted by uh, the market, and so you know, an optimistic outlook on the equity and bond markets for 2000, uh, 2020. Um, the, the flattish uh, nature to 2019, nothing un- unusual there. Uh, we did have some repositioning with a number of different uh, customers, but over time, that's a business that we have grown uh, nicely, and we see sort of normal growth in 2020. Okay, thank you. And uh, the second question is, um, can you remind me, do you have a target dividend payout ratio? We do not. Um, you know, our goal with the dividend is simply to make sure that it is sustainable. Um, that's really where our focus is. And, you know, obviously you don't want the dividend payout ratio to get too high um, if you have a, what I'll call a normal income stream, which we consider our income stream to be somewhat normal right now. So, Simply sustainable and strong, and you know we're comfortable with where it is right now. Yeah. Like just just uh, to uh, add to that, that you know obviously the last four or five years we've had very nice growth in in dividend and in return to our shareholders, so we've been very focused on that. And uh, you know you expect for the rate of growth in the dividend to start to slow out from here. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. Your next question comes from the line of Brock Vanderbilt with UBS. Good morning, Brock. Hey guys, this is Vilas uh, Abraham for uh, for Brock. Um, just uh, just a quick question on uh, you know, on Cecil. If you guys could just give a little bit more color on uh, on the day two impact. How are you thinking about that, and maybe specifically as it relates to uh, the energy portfolio? Thanks. Yeah. So uh, the day two impact um, for with regard to energy, we have to look at a couple different factors. One is not just our the economic forecast, but how the economic forecast would would impact energy specifically. And so we would expect that there would be um, you know modest growth in our reserves for energy, just like it would be uh, under the incurred model. But we don't expect Cecil would impact that uh, to any larger degree than uh, what we see under the uh, incurred model. Okay, got it. That's it for me. Thanks. I'll now turn the call back over to Kurt Farmer, President and Chief Executive Officer, for any further remarks. As always, we appreciate your uh, questions. We appreciate your interest in our company, and I want to thank you for joining the call today. Have a a very good day. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this will conclude today's call. Thank you all for joining, and you may now disconnect.